Amen, amen. Well, good morning, church. Glad to see all of you on this little bit of a dreary morning when I uh, drove in, but what a blessing for us to be able to really celebrate the Christmas season. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We finally finished with Habakkuk last week, and now we are going to spend the next couple of Sundays looking at Christmas um, just through the eyes of a a couple people that really were waiting for the Savior to come. So we'll look at both Simeon and Anna over the next couple of Sundays as we really dive into and prepare our hearts for the celebration of Jesus as our Savior. So I'm so glad you're here and worshiping with us this morning. Um, I want to let you know about a, a couple of of things, of ways that we worship the Lord. So we worship God through singing songs about him, singing songs to him. We worship God through studying his word and seeking his heart in prayer. We also worship God through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And so um, there's a couple ways that you can give. And you can give here in these different um, boxes. You can drop off your tithe or offering. On the, way, uh, on the way out after you're done with our worship service, or if you're joining us online, you can give through our website or through um, our app, or you can mail in your tithe or offering. Another thing that we're going to start this week is this is the week of prayer for our church uh, for international missions. So we've set a pretty uh, audacious goal as a church for Lottie Moon, and I believe we have a video kind of queuing up talking about um, Lottie Moon and the importance of international missions. We all lead busy lives, but if we could just stop everything and take a bird's eye view, a little higher, there. Now we can see the multitudes. We are fueled by a shared vision to bring the name of Christ to those who have yet to hear. So we move forward to extreme places, corners of the world that have no access to the gospel. We train missionaries, send them out together, and pray that God's grace be known. We help the hurting, comfort the dying, give hope to the displaced, and have seen thousands come to faith in Christ. We are able to do so much more together than if we were chasing this vision alone. This is our common effort, together. So 100% of our giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes to support international missionaries. There's over 3,000 missionaries on the field right now who are taking the gospel to hard to reach places. Our church has set a goal of $27,000 this year to give to Lottie Moon. We hit over 26 last year, so we said we got to go for 27, and we're so um, blessed to be able to support missionaries who are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, so people who need desperately to hear about Jesus. So this whole week, we're going to offer different opportunities for us to be thinking about international missions, be praying for um, international missions. On Tuesday night, you'll get to see a video where um, Pastor Andrew got to interview a, a retired missionary who was in Chile for 30 years, and she'll be sharing about taking uh, the gospel there in South America. We're going to be focused, our our week of prayer is really focused on the country of Mexico. We'll have different opportunities to be praying uh, for the Mexican people in ways that we can continue to reach people with the gospel. And we're really serious about that. And you know what, even one thing you can do 
after, right after this service, you can go out and you can get a cup of coffee. And what we're doing is we're giving proceeds from our Cornerstone Cafe all towards Lottie Moon this month. So a lot of different ways that we can be about taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Because if we really believe that Jesus is the greatest gift, then there are billions of people around the world who need to hear about Christ. So I want to ask you to prayerfully consider giving above and beyond your normal tithe to give towards Lottie Moon so we can support taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. So thankful, you know, our church has multiple people who are going overseas, who are already serving overseas through the IMB. And think of how we are going to support the work that they are doing. So I want you to just be praying about Lottie Moon and praying about what you can give as we really want to see the gospel go to the ends of the earth. Well, Luke chapter 2, as we start to set our eyes towards the manger, as we start to think about Christmas, as we get ready for all of these things, we're going to look at Christmas a little bit differently, because we're actually going to skip forward a little bit, okay? You'll get to hear a lot about Christ's birth. We're going to look at something that happened right after his birth, just a few days after um, in Luke 2, and see how Simeon and Anna reacted to encountering their Savior for the first time. So I'm thankful that you all are nice and comfortable, but I'd ask for you to please stand in honor of the reading of God's word. My friend Jonathan is going to be reading for us from Luke chapter two this morning. When the eight days were completed for his circumcision, he was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived. And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, indeed this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed and a sword will pierce your own heart, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We are thankful for your word. God, we're thankful that you are a God that keeps your promises. And just like you kept your promise to Simeon, God, we know that you'll keep your promise to us. And we're thankful, Lord, for the promise of salvation through your son, Jesus, and how we get to celebrate that as we think about your son coming and born in that major 2,000 years ago. We pray, Lord, that for the next few moments, you'd turn our minds' attention, our hearts' affection to you and to your word. God, I pray that you'd speak to us through your word. And God, I pray that in the busyness of this Christmas season, or that we wouldn't get our focus off of you, to reorient our hearts towards you this morning and speak to us through your word, Lord. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So Simeon 
has been given a promise from God. And this promise is that he will see the Savior before he dies. It's a great promise, but it's kind of an open-ended promise. You know, God apparently revealed to him, you'll see the Savior, but he did not give him an exact time, right? So he's just kind of waiting expectantly, but he doesn't know when it will happen. In fact, that's why I entitled this series over these next couple of weeks, The Wait Is Over. The wait is over because Simeon had been waiting for so long and for all of us who desperately need salvation. We know that our sin has separated us from God and we need to be a, a way to get in right relationship with him. The fact that Jesus came and lived a perfect life and then died on the cross for our sins means that the wait is over for us as well if we trust in him as our savior. But Simeon is waiting just imagine what's going through his mind as he is waiting. I don't know if, you, know if you remember, but last spring, I showed you guys a video. One of my good friends from college, one of my college roommates, uh, Tyler, his little da daughter, Scarlett, was writing a, a letter to her future brother or sister. You see, my friend Tyler and his wife, Aaron, they're adopting um, a, a child from Thailand. And they started going through the adoption process a couple years ago. And at that time, they didn't even know. Well, they just found out this summer they got matched with a little boy. And so they're so excited about that. But they got matched this summer. And now they're just waiting on the Thai government to approve all these different things. So they know they have a son. That they are at some point in time going to fly to Thailand to go and get now, this little boy will turn two in the fall, and what they've been told is be ready to go anytime, starting like in February through any time in the next year or two. They know they have a son, and they know at some point they're going to get to hold that, well, not really baby boy, right? But toddler, but government bureaucracy added on top of that global pandemic, and they are just in a holding pattern for the foreseeable future. And so they know they're going to get their son soon. And they're so excited about it, and they're ready, and their daughter, Scarlett, she's so cute because she's, she's convinced them. She's trying to tell them, I really like that I'll have a little brother, but she said, I want a little sister too. So can we just, can we just get two? <laughs> they're like, it doesn't quite work that way, right? But they're waiting expectantly, not sure any time. It could be months. It could be a year. We're not sure. But you better believe as soon as they can, they're going to head right over there to Thailand so they can pick up their baby boy. But there's this anticipation that's built up. So I know just even with talking with him about it, he's so excited, he says we're praying, but he's like, it's just, he goes like, the, the anticipation is killer, because I just am not sure when. I want to see my little boy. And I, I think about that in, in a similar way. Here we have Simeon, who's been told by God, Simeon, before you die, you're going to get to see the Messiah. And you've got to think, he's excited about that, right? But he's also thinking, uh, God, I'm not getting any younger. God, I know you've given me this promise, but... Man, the anticipation has got to be building. And yet what we see here very clearly with Simeon, I think it's with us, is we see that he completely believes this promise from God, doesn't he? 
He completely believes this promise from God. And in the same way, we need to believe. We need to believe. When we think about Christmas, we need to believe that there is a loving God who looked at you and looked at me and we're stuck in the muck and the mire of our sin and the Bible tells us that God loved us so much, he sent his son. That's what we celebrate every Christmas, right? The idea that God gave us this gift, his son. And just like Simeon believed in his heart that he was going to see the Savior, we too need to believe And we need to cling to the promise of Christmas. We need to cling to the promise of Christmas. Look what it says about Simeon. Some of these things that help us with our faith and help us believe. Look what it says about Simeon. There's a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout. See, when we believe God, It changes how we live, doesn't it? When we trust in the Lord and we allow the Holy Spirit to come inside of us, dwell in us, and we let the Holy Spirit be the one that leads us, it changes how we live. We look differently than the world. It says this about Simeon. He was righteous and devout. Looking forward to Israel's consolation. Look what else it says. It says, the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. He would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. And when we have faith, God changes us, doesn't he? When we have faith, God changes us. Some markers of those faith, as we see in Simeon, include being righteous. Being righteous, being holy, being set apart, being different than the world. Being devout, being devoted to the Lord. And being filled with the Spirit being filled with the Spirit. And this text says something pretty important about Simeon that we shouldn't overlook. In fact, sadly, it was quite rare in Simeon's day. It says that Simeon was filled with the Spirit. It says that he was filled with the Spirit. This is something that we shouldn't miss. The Bible tells us That when we are saved, that the Holy Spirit comes inside of us. It says that God takes our hearts of stone and he gives us hearts of flesh. He gives us tender hearts. And the Spirit comes and dwells in us. And now our lives are no longer our own, right? We're bought with the price. So we honor God with our bodies. And we follow the Spirit's leading. I want you to notice, look what it says about Simeon. Verse 27 says, guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. He has an encounter with Jesus. (coughs) I'd say it's because he's guided by the Spirit. And what I want to challenge you this Christmas season is don't miss the Messiah. Don't miss the Messiah. If your calendar is anything like mine, there's something I think every day leading up to Christmas. A lot of stuff going on. But Simeon made sure that he didn't miss the Messiah. And notice what it says. He followed the Spirit's leading in his life. He followed the Spirit's leading in his life. It says, guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. 
He was led by the Spirit. He's prompted by the Spirit. He goes and he enters into the temple. Think of when you've been prompted by the Spirit. Think about those times when you've been obedient to the Lord's prompting in your life. I can remember I had, in my youth group in San Antonio, I, can, I will always remember this to this day. I had these two brothers, Jacob and Jared, and Jacob was the older brother, and Jacob was one of those guys. He was just on fire for the Lord. And I love seeing how God was working his life. I remember we're at, we're at summer camp, and we're meeting as a church, and Jacob comes and he grabs me, his tears in his eyes, and he says, I need to talk with you about something. We go and we step out, and, and Jacob is sharing. He says, Zach, he said, I, I'm just so burdened. He said, my little brother isn't saved. He said, I've been praying for him. I, he's like, I don't, I don't know what to do, but he said, I just, he said, I felt like I, I need to talk with somebody about it. And so he said, I just grabbed you. And I was like, Jacob, thank you. For, for sharing that. And I said, but you don't need to tell me, <laughs> right? You don't need to tell me. I said, God is putting something on your heart. So I said, let's just get Jared right now. He says, what if I say the wrong thing? And I said, the Lord is placing this on her. Let's grab Jared. And so we pulled Jared out of our, our church group. And I still remember that night as Jacob with tears in his eyes starts to share with his little brother how he loves him and he wants his brother to have a relationship with the Lord. And Jared, that moment, something happened in him. And I know as the Holy Spirit came upon him and Jared confessed Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And I remember Jacob being prompted by the Spirit, being burdened for his little brother. And as I got to be there with Jacob and see his little brother come to Christ, isn't it amazing what happens when we're obedient to the Lord? When we Listen to those promptings or those little whispers from the Spirit, those little urges, like, why should I go over here? Why should I do it? God, what it is? You've placed someone on my heart. It might be it's Christmas season. It might be I'm gathering together with family. Or I'm at a Christmas party with coworkers, and I know I need to share about the reason for Christmas. So God, give me the words to say. I saw him do it with a 15-year-old boy. Because when we are filled with the Spirit, we are controlled by God and we're empowered to serve God. When we're filled by the Spirit, we're controlled by God, we're empowered to serve God. What if Simeon had ignored God's prompting to enter into the temple. I obviously think at some point he would have seen the Savior. What if he'd missed out on that particular moment? We can't get distracted and miss the meaning of Christmas. We can't. There can be so much going on. There are signs of Jesus everywhere Christmas time, right? You can walk into a secular establishment like Starbucks. They'll be playing Christmas music. Think about how many people perform things like Handel's Messiah, right? which is literally singing scripture. And yet we can miss out on the greater meaning. 
We can get so busy thinking, I've got to get a present for this person, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to go over here, I've got to do all these other things, and we can't let the busyness of this season overshadow our Savior. So many people miss out on what Christmas is all about. Look what Simeon does. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to reform from what was customary under the law, just imagine as Simeon sees this little boy. He just knows this child is going to be the Savior of the world. It says that he took him up in his arms and praised God. Now, Mary and Joseph are parents for the first time. So they were probably really nervous bringing Jesus into the temple. They probably had all their baby wipes, right? <laughs> and then here's this random old man who comes over and grabs their baby. And you think, hey, a little bit of distance, right? But he grabs Jesus, and what does he say? He praises God. <laughs> Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promise, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Imagine what's going on in Simeon's heart at this moment as he praises God, saying, God, I can go home now. God, you've kept your promise. God, you are faithful. God, you are good. I have seen salvation. You've prepared it in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. Simeon is full of praise to the Lord. Let it be said of our church this Christmas season that we are full of praise to God. Like Simeon, we need to praise God for providing the Messiah, don't we? We need to praise God and thank Him. Make sure that we're glorifying God for everything that He's done. And notice what He says about Jesus. What does He say? He says, He is a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Jesus is a light. And what Simeon is declaring, and this is pretty revolutionary to many of the Israelite people during this time, because what does he say? <clears throat> he says he's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to Israel. He's saying that Jesus was Savior for everyone. Jesus is Savior for everyone. And I love Luke, the story and his honesty here, right? Look what it says. It says in verse 33, his father and mother, Mary and Joseph, what? They're amazed at what was being said about him. They're still trying to figure all this stuff out, right? And here they have this little baby. They're taking him to the temple. They're dedicating him. And now all of a they're hearing that he is the Savior. And they knew it. The angel told them, but still they are amazed. They're filled with with wonder and awe that God would allow them to be parents of the Savior. And just like Mary and Joseph, we should be amazed at this Christmas miracle, shouldn't we? We should be amazed. And you know what? It would be incredible if the passage just ended right there at verse 33, but it continues. It says, then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, listen to this blessing, indeed this child is destined <clears throat> to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul 
that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. This word light in this passage is very important. Because light is a great gift. It allows us to see, right? In fact, we see God uses this metaphor a lot. Jesus calls himself what? In, in John 8, I believe, he says, I am the light of the world. And so that word light in a very positive sense, he's the light to the Gentiles, the light for revelation. He illuminates and allows us to have salvation. But he's not just a light in the positive sense. He's also a light that exposes our hearts. He's a light that exposes our hearts. Notice what he says to Mary. They're so amazed. He's blessing Jesus. He's praising God. They got to feel wonderful. Then he looks to Mary and he gives her this blessing. At first, she's going to be thinking, this is great. This, this old man just blessed my son and now he's going to bless me. And then what does he say? A sword will pierce your own soul. He says, Israel is going to oppose your son. We need to declare that Jesus is the light. We have to understand this. Understanding that Jesus is the Savior, that he is the light. We either oppose this light or we surrender to it. We can't be neutral to this revelation of Christmas, right? We either surrender ourselves fully to the light, we believe and trust in God, just like Simeon does, and we lift up the Savior Jesus and we praise God for the light of salvation. Or, like we see so many do, 33 years later, we can oppose the light by saying, God, I don't want you to be the one that runs my life. I've got this figured out. I can handle it. I want to do things in my own terms. We either oppose the light or we surrender to it. The gospel lights up darkness and exposes our sin. So we either repent and confess and believe that Jesus is the Savior, and then we can embrace the light of the world. We let him light up our lives, or we can reject the light like the religious leaders of the day. So as we think about how the wait is over, the Bible is clear. God sent his son to save us from our sins. The Bible is also clear that we have to confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, and then we will be saved. So my challenge to all of you this morning, if you haven't yet made that decision, don't just try to think, I can be neutral about this whole Jesus thing. I kind of like living my life on my own terms. I kind of think I know what's best for me. So I'm just going to continue to do things the way that I want. The Bible tells us that's not an option. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is the light of the world. So that light exposes the sin in our hearts and shows us our need for a Savior. So my challenge to you this morning is if you've never made that decision to trust in him, would you, like Simeon, confess and believe that Jesus is the Savior. The wait is over. Our Savior is here. Now let's surrender to him and let that light fill up our lives. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We're thankful for your son. God, we are so thankful that your son, Jesus, is our Savior. He is the light of the world who came to light up the darkness, Lord, and give us eternal life. But I pray right now, Lord, if there's anyone in this room, anyone joining us online that hasn't made that decision to trust in your son, we pray, God, that you 
would transform their hearts even now. Lord, that you'd take their hearts of stone and give them tender hearts, give them hearts of flesh. God, let them confess that your son Jesus is Lord. Be with us now, Lord. We're so thankful the wait is over and our Savior is here. We love you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.